and welcome to this three-part World Hepatitis Alliance Tools for Change webinar series. My name is Jeff Lazarus from the University of Copenhagen. I'll be chairing today's session where we'll be addressing the global health sector strategy for viral hepatitis and different policy tools and how they can help us work for change and work towards the elimination of hepatitis B and C. Um, we have a full online house and before I introduce our four speakers and thank you to all of them for joining us here tonight, um, let me say a few words to everyone else who is listening in. You can type in questions at any time. We'll have two dedicated question and answer sessions or I'll try and also interject some of those questions while the panelists are making their short presentations. We also plan to have two instant, sort of quick and anonymous polls, and I'll give you more instructions about them um, when they come, when we get a little bit later on in the webinar, but we'll be asking you a question, you'll be able to respond online, and we'll get the answers rather um, instantaneously, and they'll be able to um, inform our, um, our discussion. So, um, let me introduce our panelists. Raquel Peck is a co-founder of the World Hepatitis Alliance and its CEO now. Um, Bissy Bright is the first vice chairman of Live Well Initiative, calling in from Nigeria. Stefan Victor is the team leader of the Global Hepatitis Program um, at the World Health Organization. And John Ward is with us. Um, he's the director of the Division of Biohepatitis at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. And as I mentioned, we will have um, each panelist making a short presentation with some discussion um, between the panelists. We encourage panelists to, um, to ask questions while others are presenting and for all of you to send in questions. And firstly, we'll have um, Mattel Peck presenting how to use policy documents to drive national change. Then Bissy Bright giving us a case study. Um, Live Well is a member of the World Hepatitis Alliance and she'll be giving us a case study from the patient perspective. John Ward at the CDC will be giving us a government case study and Stefan Victor will be presenting the very exciting forthcoming global health sector strategy for viral hepatitis. So Raquel, over to you. How to use policy documents to drive national change. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so the reason why we um, prepared this uh, webinar for you is because um, after talking to um, our members and also some other organizations, we realized that there was um, a lack of awareness when it came to um, policy documents that could really advance um, and, and help support um, advocacy efforts from, from everybody. And by policy documents, I mean UN resolutions, like WHO resolutions, for example, but also declarations and manifestos coming out of um, high-level um, policy meetings, and even to a certain extent, um, the Sustainable Development Goals. So, if we were to take the, um, oh, sorry about that, there you go. If we were to take the, um, the declarations as an example, um, the most recent one, the one that comes to mind uh, is the Glasgow Declaration, we have a picture there. And what's great about um, it is that it was signed uh, by uh, an array of um, stakeholders and it really created pressure for, for action. Now, if you for any reason weren't uh, one of the signatories, um, the way it is you can use this document and um, uh, not only to take it to your government but also perhaps finding out who the signatories were and starting partnerships um, that can be very important too. Um, just um, moving on to um, um, resolutions, um, we in hepatitis we are very lucky because we have two resolutions. And again, from to focus on how we can use that for policy change, I'm just going to mention very briefly the 2014 resolution, where we have a clause there that clearly states that um, governments should be promoting the involvement of civil, civil society in all aspects of preventing, diagnosing, and treating viral hepatitis. What essentially this means is that if you're an NGO in your country and you're aware that your government is delivering awareness campaigns or developing a national strategy and you haven't been consulted, this is a great opportunity for you to take this document to them, disclose to them, and actually say, look, you agreed to that. 
and civil society, let's discuss. Um, so these, these documents can be very powerful. Um, lastly, I wanted to bring, um, in, uh, bring up the um, Sustainable Development Goals, because for the first time we have a mention um, in, in, in those goals, and this clearly shows the world, really, that um, hepatitis is priority within global health. And again, we shouldn't underestimate the power of, of that mention. So I just wanted to um, bring that up. And just before I, I, I finish, and the reason why we're hosting the webinar, really, and that's why the title is the Global Strategy, I just wanted to say that this could be, in terms of policy documents, the game changer for hepatitis. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I know that Stefan's going to be presenting on it later, but um, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of, of, of this document over, uh, overall. Thanks. That, that, that's my pitch for now. Thanks a lot, a lot Raquel. Raquel, um, you know, when you co-founded um, the World Hepatitis Alliance some, some 10 years ago, there were, there were no major policy documents in the field of hepatitis. So we've seen a huge change with these two um, World Health Assembly resolutions and now the sustainable development goals from, from last year. I wonder what you think about um, the move from the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, which came to an end last year, and now these SDGs. And particularly, I'm thinking about SDG 3, or, or 3.3, um, which deals with, with HIV and hepatitis, and has some interesting wording around ending HIV, um, TB, and malaria, but combating hepatitis. What, what's the Alliance view on this? Well, definitely, we think that you know the wording should be should have been in line with you know the other diseases because we can end really hepatitis. We we, we have a curative medicine for hepatitis C. We have vaccination for hepatitis B, and and a really good treatment that can control the disease. So why not? But um, at the same time, and as you mentioned, when we started just a couple you know some some years ago, we didn't have policies. We didn't even have. Um, anyone at WHO, I mean, we're lucky now we have Stefan here presenting to us, but um, um, we had no one at the 8,000 people working for WHO that had hepatitis in their job title. So in a short amount of time, we really came and we progressed really fast. And I think that I, 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 I do um, uh, understand and I actually agree that uh, combat is not the best word um, and we really wanted to push for end. But uh, we have to be glad that we were mentioned. We weren't mentioned in the, the Millennium Development Goals. We were completely forgotten. So the fact that we are there, I think we just should go with it and celebrate it and make the most out of it, really. Okay, thank you. We'll discuss more about you know, these goals and then what it means to end and combat and eliminate and, and eradicate a bit <laughs> later on. Let me turn to the audience now um, with a question for you. Um, we're going to have a quick poll. And there should be um, a screen allowing you to vote and answer the question, have you used policy documents like a resolution or declaration in your advocacy activities? Oh, here's the final, 76 and 24 percent. Thank you for that. Um, so this is interesting. So about three quarters of the attendees here have used policy documents. And it will be interesting to think about, you know, why have you used policy documents, how, at the, which kinds of documents, national, international, and where. And for the 24% who haven't, um, why not? You know, what are the barriers and, and obstacles to doing that? And you can also send us some of your comments and we can read them out for you, or you can ask questions directly to um, the panelists. Let me proceed now to, um, to Bissy Bright, who is a, is a, um, head of the member organization of the World Hepatitis Alliance, the CEO of the Live Well Initiative. Over to you, Bissi, calling in from Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I'd like to thank the World Hepatitis Alliance for this opportunity. Um, I'll start by talking about the um, statistics um, that we, we've had in, in the country. We found that one in every 12 um, Nigerians um, uh, are living with some form of viral hepatitis, either B or C. And um, this is um, a palpable challenge for government and um, for the people. 
And then in line with the 2010 uh, resolution on the global health uh, sector strategy, um, that kind of helps to spur us on as a public health um, NGO in looking at uh, public health issues of major concern. And so we convene um, a high level strategic focus group uh, discussion um, in the year 2013, precisely on the 31st of July. And the first topic we talked about was hepatitis in Africa. Now, this meeting included very top level policy, high level policymakers. We actually approved the Lagos State Government, the Lagos State Ministry of Health. And then the Honorable Commissioner was privy to this, and the Honorable Permanent Secretary Health at the time was the chairman. He acceded to our invitation to chair this high-powered um, strategic focus group discussion. We had very top-level um, private sector players. Um, I wouldn't really mention names here. And then even within government, we had very key uh, opinion leaders within government and the private sector. Within government, we had the tertiary leaders of the tertiary health institutions and so on. And this focus group discussion really came up with a lot of things concerning hepatitis. The main outcomes were um, twofold, the real palpable outcomes. The first thing we achieved was that there was a communique, which you would find on the website of Live Well Initiative, and the media, the major media in the country, media houses, business day publications, The Guardian, The Vanguard, and The Punch newspapers carried a lot of news about this communique. Some actually published the communique wholesale. And the communique called for action on hepatitis uh, as regards hepatitis awareness, screening, and treatment. Then in addition, the second palpable thing we achieved was that soon after that, the Lagos State government put in place a viral, viral a very active viral hepatitis committee. And uh, this was um, the baby, principally the baby of the Honorable Permanent Secretary Health then who chaired the strategic focus group discussion. So we were really happy that there were particular outcomes. And as a result of this effort, we also worked in addition to that, we, there was a visiting professor from the United States who had done a lot of work on hepatitis. I was working with the hepatologist in Nigeria. So apart from working from the angle of the patient group, this professor was also working with hepatologist, and we were able to link her with um, the Honorable Commissioner of Health, Lagos, and we had a very, very useful meeting, and she, she proceeded to Abuja and also held very important meetings with uh, the Federal Ministry of Health at the center. And then eventually we found that uh, with time, a draft policy on uh, viral hepatitis emanated. And we were very happy. We're not claiming full credit for that, but we believe that we, we, we contributed significantly in building that foundation. And then um, the draft policy has now materialized. It was launched on World Hepatitis Day last year on July 28, 2015 by the federal government of Nigeria. And after that, um, we had um, the technical working group on hepatitis, which had its first meeting just a week ago. And then um, members of the National uh, Viral Hepatitis Network in Nigeria were involved. The, the coordinator actually attended that meeting. And the, the major outcome is that we are hoping that World Hepatitis uh, Alliance members will be more involved in the technical working group of government. And, and, um, and we believe that most of this was achieved as a result of the, our action on the 2010 resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm sorry, this is just that I, I was trying to interrupt you there. So I had this burning question. Uh, apologies if yes. I was uh, interrupting you. But um, I wondered if you could um, explain a little bit more around the process, because um, it's great that you used the 2010 resolution to achieve, as you said, some, such positive changes, the, uh, the draft of a, a plan, and so so on. And, all. and I just wondered if you have members um, watching this and listening to this, um, if you could explain a little bit more about, you know, how did you do it? Did you, for instance, did you write letters? Um, did you pick up the phone to the government? And were they committed, or did you have to do some um, some um, convincing? Yes, it, it took a bit of um, relationship building, I would call it. 
for so we we've kind of uh, found it very essential to build a relationship with government, and over time we worked with government within the organisation. We built a rapport with government. We normally invite them to our programs and so on. And so when this hepatitis thing came up, and we saw it as a very palpable problem, it was really easy to convince them. We actually approached government. Um, you know, we are located in Lagos, so we approached the Lagos State Government, talked to them about this, and then wrote officially to government through the Honorable Commissioner of Health, Lagos State, who is number one person, and um, and we, the Honorable Permanent Secretary Health was um, selected. We, we, we requested that he should kindly chair the committee because we knew that the Honorable Commissioner would be too busy to, to sit down on such a focus group. Um, and then we were hosting this in our head office. So we felt that the Honorable Commissioner might not want to delegate this to And the Honorable Permanent Secretary Health because we had worked with his ministry and with him and his team all along, it, it made it, it permeated the, 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 it paved the way to, to get them convinced. Of course, we had to follow up. We wrote proper proposals and then followed up with um, VC. But it wasn't really difficult to convince them, especially when we told them that um, um, the, the composition of the strategic focus group they saw that these were responsible organizations, uh, both in the public and private sector, that we were bringing into the focus group. And so it was very easy. And we actually brought in um, a physician who is based in the US and the a tele-journalist um, as the co-chairman of the committee to give it some media presence and some uh, global attention also, and to let people really see the seriousness of what we were doing. And Great. to show that this, uh, okay, thank you, thank you. So I'm just going to jump in because we have a very busy program and I know there's already some questions coming in and um, I'll soon direct them to the different panelists. They're, they're including you as well, Bissy. Um, before we turn to our next panelist, um, let me do remind everyone that um, you are welcome to continue to send in questions, but there's also some questions you can answer yourself. So we've mentioned um, a couple of resolutions from the World Health Assembly. We've mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals, the Millennium Development Goals. And you, know, you can look up those things um, online. You can also go to the Hepatitis Program, WHO's Hepatitis Program's website and the website of the World Health Hepatitis Alliance, where you know, these documents are posted and you can read them in detail. So let me now um, Thank advance you. over to um, over to John Ward to give us a government perspective um, from the U.S. On, and, and the work of the CDC on, on the Viral Hepatitis National Action Plan. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be part of the uh, World Hepatitis Alliance uh, webinar today. And we'll just take a few moments to describe uh, national policy development for viral hepatitis um, in the United States. Um, here in the United States, the uh, planning really began back in about 2008 when the, uh, those of us at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, recognized the need for a national plan. We turned to the United States Institute of Medicine, which is the authoritative body in the country that is charged with um, um, advising the United States government on matters of science, including health. We um, met with their public health committee, um, described the um, issues uh, as we saw them around viral hepatitis, the unmet needs, the growing morbidity and mortality, the missed opportunities for prevention. Uh, they agreed that this topic was worthy of their uh, review um, and accepted the uh, charge of looking uh, at viral hepatitis and developing a plan uh, for the country. Um, the CDC um, um, provided some resources for that uh, review. Uh, it was not enough to pay for the whole amount, so we did have to uh, work with partners to uh, come up with the, uh, the total dollar amount for this uh, report. The Institute of Medicine then convened a, a body of experts um, on hepatitis, 
on public health, um, on um, various prevention strategies such as vaccination and um, issues regarding persons who inject drugs, um, and there was also opportunities for public comment. The uh, otherwise, the committee uh, meets fair, uh, very independently of any part of the U.S. government, uh, including CDC uh, and the funders. So it's very much an independent body, um, and they um, centered their recommendations, uh, which were released in January of 2010, uh, in four areas: surveillance, knowledge and awareness, immunizations and the need for services for persons living uh, with viral hepatitis. The next slide uh, then shows how in particular, um, thank you, um, they made uh, four key points that the uh, uh, viral hepatitis was an underappreciated health problem for the country. Uh, they termed the, uh, uh, the problem a silent epidemic for the United States. Uh, and that that silent epidemic um, was reflected by a lack of public awareness, lack of provider awareness, a lack of resources, and a lack of national planning, creating really a vicious cycle of, um, of um, under-recognition, poor capacity, and missed opportunities for prevention, care, and treatment. Took that charge from the Institute of Medicine and turn to the health ministry in the United States, which is known as the Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, under the leadership of the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary for Health, Dr. Hire Howard Coe, we uh, then developed a, uh, an action plan for, the, uh, for the, all the health agencies within the U.S. government, um, and focusing on very much the priorities that were given from the Institute of Medicine, education, improving testing, care, and treatment, surveillance, focusing on key populations such as persons who inject drugs, and recognizing transmissions occurring in the healthcare um, sector. So that action plan was released in 2011, about 15 months after the Institute of Medicine report was released, um, and um, and. It did provide an opportunity to, to, to monitor progress over a three-year period between 2011 to 2014. Uh, and since that time, there has been a second uh, action plan um, to continue on that work, which um, uh, went from 2014 through 2016. And now we are just now had our first kickoff meeting last week to do a third version uh, of our action plan. John, just a just quick question while we're going to the next slide. I just wondered if you could um, um, let us know if, um, you know, what was the involvement of civil society when those plans were being drafted? Did you consult with them? Just in line with what I was saying before, I just wondered if uh, just, just, you had a similar process in the U.S. Yes, we went through, um, in the development of the first action plan, we had uh, we, we made two opportunities for public input, and so we had either an in-person meeting or we set up a, a conference call so that everyone could, uh, that wanted to could call in uh, and ask questions about what the first plan draft would look like, and then we developed a draft and then got a second round of comments. Uh, go, can we go back one slide, please, uh, Jeff? I'm sorry I'm having a little trouble with my control. Just to show the timelines of these activities, as I mentioned, Institute of Medicine report was released in 2010, the first national action plan in 2011, and then that was followed by an um, increase in our budget for the Division of Viral Hepatitis, where we received uh, about a $10 million uh, increase in our budget, which represents about a 30% increase, um, and then that uh, increase has been sustained uh, over the budget year since that time with a gradual um, increase thereafter. So there has been a, a an association in time that planning uh, was followed by an increased commitment to hepatitis, um, which I think was driven by people recognizing that this was important 
and a, and a plan was in place that could be used to monitor progress. And finally, the next slide, just wanted to leave you with the, uh, the importance of that planning is an ongoing activity. Uh, I mentioned that our action plan was about to be um, entering its third phase. Uh, we have also now asked the Institute of Medicine to look at the issues regarding viral hepatitis prevention, care, and treatment once again, um, recognizing, as you'll be hearing in a moment from Stefan, the move by, from, by the World Health Organization to set elimination goals for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. We have asked the IOM here in the United States to look at this issue as well uh, regarding the elimination uh, in terms of incidence uh, and mortality and setting um, a time frame to reach uh, elimination goals um, and to develop a plan to bring the key stakeholders together to address critical success factors um, and barriers um, in progress uh, uh, going forward. Um, so we, we look forward to the Institute of Medicine having the first phase of that report released in April of this year and their final plan released in the first quarter of 2017. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. I hope, um, I hope the IOM's new report has the same catalyzing effect as, as it did um, back in, in 2010. That was quite exciting to see that, that case study set up that way. So a question came in um, for both Bissy and, and John. I'll just read it, and it says, um, well, I, I'm afraid it might not be a yes, no, or, or, or maybe it will be. Um, will it be possible to eliminate hepatitis in Nigeria and the U.S. by 2030? Shall I go first? Please. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, please. 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 John, please. 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 from the BBC. And yes, I, I think John may be able to predict the answer better. But by the year 2030 in Nigeria, yes, I believe the things that is the um, uh, global health sector strategy goal to eliminate hepatitis um, to, uh, to, 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 yes, to help control, bring hepatitis B under control and to help to cure hepatitis C by the year 2030. Yes, I believe this is achievable because the, within the Nigerian nation, um, there is so much um, um, going on in hepatitis right now. That is, there is a lot of eagerness on the part of government to work with the civil service organizations to which I belong. And, um, and so we know that if that's the case, it would be very easy with that kind of cooperation um, having a tripartite in there, you're thinking the private sector as a third party to help to eliminate hepatitis. And the most important thing is the awareness, advocacy, sensitization, and screening, which is being done already. And it just needs um, to be scaled at the national level and it will get into the rural areas. And that's where CSOs come in. CSOs will take you to the farthest end of the nation. So, yes, I believe it is doable that Nigeria will achieve that target. Thank you. Excellent. Later we can talk about what, what, what it means to eliminate, but that's fantastic that you're so optimistic coming from such a, a big country with so many challenges. John, what do you think? Well, I think um, elimination goals can be achieved in the United States. If, um, if you just um, you know, keep in mind the powerful interventions that we have available for hepatitis, vaccinations, high quality testing, um, highly effective curative treatments for hepatitis C and very effective treatments for hepatitis B, uh, and you join those with interventions such as blood bank safety, improvements in patient safety, and improvements in harm reduction for persons who inject drugs, you really recognize that what's missing is the political commitment and the capacity to bring those interventions together with the populations that can benefit from them. So, it's, it's, so we have the we have the tools, and what we need to do going forward is to build that capacity. And when we do so, we can achieve uh, the elimination goals we set out for ourselves. Thank you. That sounds fantastic. And our next speaker is actually going to talk a little bit about um, issues related to the political will and the political commitment of WHO's member states to hepatitis. So I'll turn over to Dr. Stefan Victor. Um, Sorry about the glitches in the slides. What is the global 
health sector strategy for biohepatitis. Tell us a little bit about it. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks to the other speakers too. So raising some of the key key issues that I want to address. Um, the um, as Raquel mentioned, uh, we have a real opportunity now with the, the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals, which are a broad-ranging set of goals that cover really the range of development activities that the world has agreed to take on. There's one health goal, uh, which is very broadly stated, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. And within that, there is a sub-goal or target, which includes the wording around combating hepatitis, as we can mention. So we see this as a real move forward in the sense that, as opposed to the NDGs now, uh, this, uh, they do specifically mention hepatitis. Uh, the, the, we position our strategy, which is the first WHO global hepatitis strategy, in the same context as, context as some of the other major HIV infectious diseases, major infectious diseases like HIV, TB, malaria, all of which are calling for elimination, meaning a significant reduction in the number of deaths and the number of new infections, and in the range of 90 to 95%. The, the, the strategy that we've developed, which is, is, in, is available on the, uh, on the WHO website, has a vision where uh, a world where, where hepatitis transmission is stopped and everyone has, effective to, has, effect, has access to a safe, affordable, and effective prevention treatment and care. We want to eliminate viral hepatitis as a major public health threat by 2030. And it's important to remember that the SDG and WHO both view the health goal and the sub goals as being met through universal health coverage. That it's not about these specific programs and promoting your specific interventions, but it's really about strengthening the health system. Luckily, to address hepatitis comprehensively, you do need a strong health system. And so any actions to develop the strength of hepatitis, prevention, and treatment will uh, improve uh, universal health coverage. The goals are to reduce uh, the, the number of new infections by 90% from an estimated 6 to 10 million now to about 900,000 in 2030. The uh, mortality reduction goal is 65% reduction in the number of deaths due to chronic hepatitis B and C from 1.4 million to under 500,000. This is what we feel is achievable if we scale up the service, uh, as I'll mention in a moment, and is in line with, uh, with the other major infection disease killers that I mentioned, a proportional reduction uh, that, is, is, that brings elimination as, uh, of our habitats as a major public health problem. So it's not getting rid of the infections completely, that is not yet feasible, but really is bringing it down so it's no longer a major cause of death and disability. Stephen, let me just introduce you there. I'm just going to go back. Um, if you can go back just one slide. I'm wondering, since we have, you know, Raquel here from the World Hepatitis Alliance, um, you know, we're hearing that these are, are achievable. We also hear um, in discussions that they're, they're very ambitious. And I'm just wondering what um, the World Hepatitis Alliance, which you know, brings together over 200 patient organizations from 80 countries, you know, what are we hearing from the patient groups? What do you think? Is it, is it too ambitious? Oh, not it's ambitious not enough? A, it's, it's not. Oh, well, it is. Oh, okay. Uh, we, we believe it's, they, they're ambitious, but we we really think that you know, what we were mentioning earlier about uh, hepatitis being uh, uh, left to the side in the Millennium, Millennium Development Goals and not having a mention, and also the fact that there's so much uh, catching up to do um, that the civil society really feels that these, need, these targets need to be ambitious to really drive um, the action that's needed to eliminate hepatitis B and C. So one thing that we've been really um, asking for, again, this strategy is important, but it hasn't been adopted yet, uh, but really for, for us to be contacting our governments and to really making sure that um, the commitment is up there and that they do sign up to those targets. All right, thanks. Thanks, Raquel. Back to you, Stefan. Great. Well, thanks. The, um, we know how to do this. Uh, we do have effective interventions that can prevent infection and that can prevent death. They're listed on this slide. And you really want to address, you want to boost immunization for hepatitis B among children, among newborns, among high-risk groups. We need to make sure that injections are safe because this is a major cause of, uh, of transmission, especially for hepatitis C in largely many parts of the world. 
Injected drug users are at high risk of acquiring HPV, and it's important to provide them with uh, harm reduction services, including you know, steroids, syringes, and needles to prevent that transmission. Safe sex is important, particularly for hepatitis B, to include the food of condom promotion. And then hepatitis B treatment, which can suppress the virus and reverse the fibrosis, and hepatitis C cure need to be promoted. And so in our strategy, we have a target of 90% of people diagnosed by 2030, 90% of those who have hepatitis B or C diagnosed, and 90% of those on treatment. So you can see, when you realize how low the coverage is now, perhaps less than 1%, uh, now we want to get to 90% tested, 90% treated. So really a very ambitious uh, that, uh, that uh, targets that are going to require especially engagement, political will, uh, and, and financing. The strategy was endorsed by the world, the executive board in uh, January, which is sort of a governing board uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the World Health Organization, and will be adopted by the full World Health Assembly in May. Uh, in the meantime, we're working to address some of the comments from the executive board and to work with member states to make sure that any concerns they may have are addressed, so that they will support it in May. And this is where the uh, alliance members can really play a role. And, and so, as it was mentioned, engage with your policymakers, uh, talk to the government officials if possible, and try to uh, uh, support and say how important it is that this strategy be endorsed, that we think it's a, it's a, it's a major step forward in addressing this major, major uh, cause of death and disability. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And, and I already have a question from the audience about that, um, asking, um, you know, are there any do's or, or don'ts with regards to um, contacting member states and trying to garner increased support so that the, um, that the strategy actually is adopted um, in May? Well, I think that, I mean, it's going to vary from country to country, so the approaches and who, who you can reach. I think one important point is uh, that we remember that this strategy is in the context of universal health coverage. So we don't view this as really promoting a hepatitis-specific approach. And I think that's an important message, is that uh, in talking to policymakers and sort of making that link between hepatitis prevention and treatment and health system strengthening and universal health coverage. I think we need to, I mean, we have to say it and we have to believe it and we have to make it happen. So that, and that's a challenge for us at WHO also. We're a vertical program. We deal with hepatitis. But uh, the era of these kind of programs is over. And we really have to, to learn the language and, and, and really, and really uh, embrace this universal health coverage as a way of achieving our targets. I mean, can I just jump in there because we have like a government representative here, so it'd be great, John, if you could um, also briefly comment on that. I mean, if we were to be contacting you, uh, would you recommend any specific uh, ways of doing that, like letters would be good? Because we are the Alliance, we obviously, we're thinking about sending out template letters to our members and, and also other materials, but I, we want to make sure that these are effective, so I, I, would you perhaps, like, share your, your opinion with us? Uh, you, you mean opinion about um, the WHO strategy of incorporating hepatitis into a health system strengthening? Is that what you're asking? Not, I mean, not really. I'm just wondering if, um, if we were to be contacting you, a civil society contacting government, to keep the commitment up, to get this strategy adopted. Well, um, let me be, let, let yeah. me trace if I can. John, I think um, with, with your experience sitting on the government side, um, you know, like I asked Evan with the do's and don'ts, um, what kinds of things work from civil society actors? Because Raquel mentioned um, they would be helping their members send letters to their government. I mean, we, we, they want to engage with government, but at the same time, they don't want to upset them. And every country yeah. is different, but do you have any kind of maybe lessons? Yeah, every country, every country is different. And But I, in the United States, the uh, the input of civil society is critical. It's very, very important to um, to make it known to policymakers and, and even health officials uh, that um, this is a a problem of concern to the public. Um, I, there are you know many, many examples of how I have seen the government and CDC respond to that public um, public um, expression of concern. So I think the 
public engagement is critical, you know, at every step. And that's why we, you know, we're about to release our strategic plan for our division in the next several weeks. And we're releasing it for public comment before we finalize it to get that public input. So we want to uh, continue to encourage public uh, involvement. And frankly, we would like to grow it uh, uh, rather than to avoid it. I think it's it's such a critical piece of what we do. Yeah, I mean, Raquel, if I, if I can comment back, and thank you, John, for that. I mean, I guess even in the countries where civil society involvement isn't isn't so positively looked upon. I think it's it's always worth um worth the effort to make that kind of that kind of noise and to draw attention um attention to it. Let me now um turn to to everyone out there with a um with a poll. Um so again on your screen we should have um let me go back a poll that will ask you to Respond to will you will you contact your government ahead of the World Health Assembly to ask them to adopt the global health sector strategy on viral hepatitis. So I realize that some of you out there are individuals, not necessarily working in an organization, and you know you might not reach out to your government. Um, but for you know for others, um, what do you think? Will you contact your government ahead of the assembly? The assembly is in mid-May, and as Stefan mentioned, um, just last month, the executive board of the World Health Organization um, you know, had strong support for, um, for the strategy moving ahead to, to the May. Oh, yeah. I will just turn to my right and see if I can read the screen. Great. So we have 79% responding yes. That's excellent. 21% Responding no, and I imagine, like I said, that there's a number of reasons for that, but I think 79%, um, you know, committing or saying, at least stating that you will um, reach out to your government um, is, is excellent. So, I will advance um, to our next slide. And just remind everyone that you can continue to, um, to submit um, questions, and I have one here. Um, out for me, so let me read that. Um, will um, there be more of a focus on stigma and tackling discrimination in the final version of the global strategy? This reference a question about um, will there be more focus on stigma and tackling discrimination in the strategy? Sorry. Well, this is a, a tough question. I think it, it, is, it is mentioned in there, perhaps for some it is not enough mentioned. I think that. One of the challenges we face is, is, is getting the right balance between the, the, the special the special groups or the key populations, as they're called in HIV language, and the general population. We know that the, uh, that the hepatitis is really a problem in the general population of other countries, and there's some concern about about over you know, stigmatizing by being associated with certain groups. So I think that really trying to get the right balance. It, it is there definitely. I think at this point it's not going to be. Uh, we're not. Uh, it's pretty fine on uh, so uh, if, there's, um, if there's not enough attention to it, I think it's in the, in the, in the implementation that we need to address it. But we realize it's a very important issue, and the the, param the, the dimensions of it are very different in different countries. And so trying to, I think that's part of the challenge, is addressing all the, the, the country-specific aspects of stigma and, and, and the stigma against the groups that are likely to be infected versus the stigma of people who are infected. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot to take on the strategy, which is meant to be a really a, a global document, but absolutely has to be viewed as a, as a key intervention and, and a key problem to address. And we just keep hearing over and over again how it's just a barrier for people accessing services. Thank you. I mean, I know that stigma and discrimination, for particularly for the patient groups, is, is really a, a big issue. I mean, it relates to legal issues and regulations and even banking issues with, um, you know, being in, infected with hepatitis may be leading to the inability to, to get a mortgage to, to buy a house or an apartment and so on. So these are bigger issues and it actually leads into to the next question I have here, um, which is um, you know, how will the um, health sector strategy on biohepatitis um, interact with other um, sectors including um, occupational and employment issues and, and industry and so on. 
the, the, the strategy really is, is a health sector strategy and that it's really uh, WHO deals with health and um, we realize that just uh, as with the other major infection disease killers, it really needs to be a broader response. And uh, there's, um, I think that's why that is so important that it's included in the sustainable development goals because that is a response that's much broader than the health sector. And so I think that uh, that's where we think there's an opportunity to promote in other sectors and trying to engage other, other sectors. But I think the strategy itself really is is a health sector response, uh, as the name implies, and I think that's really the mandate of WHO. I just wanted to add, if, if I may, on, on that, because one of the arguments that we've been using um, is around um, health system strengthening and how if you tackle hepatitis, because you're going to be um, uh, dealing with, as, as you mentioned, immunization, maternal health, injection safety, blood safety, and a lot of other areas, inevitably you will be strengthening your health system. So I just want to put that there because this is something that uh, we also hear that um, you're not no longer talking about vertical programs and it's all about you know an horizontal approach. So we also have been a civil society adapting to that and using that argument that tackle hepatitis and you're going to have a very strong um, health um, system as a, as, a, as a result. Raquel, um, you know, I wonder I, I think that sounds great, um, but I wonder, um, you know, if other groups working in their maybe disease-specific areas might, might make the same argument. And there's a question here, and, you know, any of the panelists are welcome to respond. It says, in the context of universal health coverage, how do we prioritize biohepatitis in interventions? So how, does, you know, how does hepatitis not get lost in, in this UHC, this universal health coverage discussion? I really think that because we really, if you are to eliminate hepatitis, there's so many areas that you're going to have to tackle, as I, as I mentioned before, but we have a very strong argument, um, but I, 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 I don't know, I mean, like, I wonder if maybe, John, you would agree with that, but this, is, this has been the approach, and, uh, I, and I think that perhaps I'm not aware of um, um, other areas that and have so many crossovers, they have, perhaps they have, perhaps they are using this argument, but I don't know, I'll be interested to know from the government perspective uh, on health system strengthening versus hepatitis, if um, you're doing anything about it, you've heard um, internally, if, if that works as well as an argument? Well, I don't think it's an either or. I think you, um, you know, as you, um, you know, um, strive or, you know, um, make efforts to strengthen your uh, a health system, you have to have um, a group of viral hepatitis uh, experts and interested parties to show them what can be achieved with viral hepatitis prevention as you strengthen your health system. So just recently we have, you know, we have made changes in the health system within the United States. We then use those, uh, use those, um, improvements to the benefit of our hepatitis prevention. For example, uh, uh, recommending a one-time screen for all persons born 1945 to 1965, that was adopted as a national testing recommendation, and under our new health law, that uh, was a required service to be made available to every patient in health plans in the country. That wasn't available five years ago. But if there's not a, a program there, um, you know, looking at the information, developing policies, putting them forward and getting them adopted, you can have a health system as strong as you would like, but it's not helping hepatitis. So, you, yes, do we need a, a strong um, health systems? Absolutely. Why is that important for hepatitis? Well, as Stefan has so ably uh, presented several times, Many of the interventions benefit other disease prevention programs and not just hepatitis alone. So it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a great um, way of showing that um, a lot of these costs can be shared. But you know, while we, but in summary, while we look to improve health systems around the world, we have to have uh, programs uh, in place, or at least at the WHO level, to uh, show them what can be achieved uh, for viral hepatitis prevention in those stronger systems. 
Thanks, John. Um, a question coming in here. Um, in some countries, hepatitis is strongly stigmatized with injecting drug use. And what strategies can the panelists suggest to civil society groups to persuade governments not to be influenced by stigma? And we heard harm reduction mentioned earlier, and harm reduction is a priority um, in, in, the strat in the strategy and has long time been a priority in WHO, UNAIDS, and UNODC and in many government plans. But here um, the question is, is how do we address that, that stigma? You mentioned, John, I think one good way, which is the, um, the offer of a test um, to everyone from the 1945 to 1965 um, generation. But um, are there any other ways anyone can think about this? Um, how do we destigmatize uh, hepatitis from injecting drug use? I, mean, I don't know if Stefan, you want to go first because of the, the guidelines that are coming out. Um, but I, just before I jump in, go ahead, go ahead. It, 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 it's a very sensitive topic. So I wondered, because obviously we are going to be very uh, like pro in terms of destigmatizing, but I'd, I'd like to offer the opportunity first to you. All right. Did, no, but let me get the, the question is the destigmatizing the link between hepatitis and injection drug use? Or? Yeah, so I, I understand it as, you know, some people say, well, people with viral hepatitis have been injecting drugs. And, and we know that, that that's not always the case. That linkage comes and then it becomes. Well, that's where, that's where the patient groups are so important because I think um, that, that you're right, that they're, they're, as a key population, the injecting drug use, you get. There's a lot of attention, both positive and negative, and a lot, of, and, and and unfortunately because of very high hepatitis C rates, and those two things get get kind of conflated. So I think that the really the, the the role the patient organizations can play is I think politicians really uh, really listen to people who are who are, who are affected by health problems, who are seeking treatment, or or, or who have a success story of having been cured. And I think that so the more we hear from the groups that are not linked to any of those. Any of, the, uh, any of the risk groups, I think that's, uh, that's how we get the message across. We say that this is a general problem in many countries, although there are clearly some countries where the majority of HCV infections are among drug users, that's in Eastern Europe, um, I mean, in, the, in, the, in the richer countries. Certainly in the middle-income countries uh, and low-income countries, that's not the case. It's just the general population. So really hearing from those, the people who aren't part of the, the, the key populations and hearing your story is, is how I think you make that, you sort of try to break that link. Also, a lot of that has to do with, um, um, and a lot of the stigma coming, um, emerging from like a lack of awareness. Um, one of the things that we are um, trying to do, um, and we're going to be doing this year, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because we're going to be addressing it in the next um, webinar, it's around creating and launching an elimination movement to really get um, the general public aware of hepatitis risk, transmission risks, etc., and perhaps the linkage that, as Stefan said, in many countries that is a reality, but you can't just think hepatitis and then automatically think um, IDU, for instance. So there's some work that's going to be carried out um, this year, but again, I'm not going to talk too much because it's, uh, we're going to be addressing it later. Thanks, Raquel. And it's actually, yeah, if anyone else has any comments, no, just I think you're absolutely right. It's really awareness and education, and informing people of the fact that it's not that there's other routes of transmission. In some countries, that's you know the healthcare associated transmission is the principal way people get infected. Nothing to do with their own personal behaviors. So I'm conscious of the time, and I have um, another question, and I'll ask um, Raquel for just a short response. It says, "Can we set up an internet database of things that worked in some countries?" for members of the of the alliance to use and learn from. And, and I would add to that, maybe for anyone to use and, and, and learn from. Whoever sent this question, I was going to say that's very timely because uh, we are going to launch, uh, yes we can, um, we are going to actually launch a, um, a hub with, um, with all of what's been discussed here um, uh, in, around policy, all the documents that can be used and how they can be used. Um, and also around case studies, because now we had, a, you know, we're very lucky we had BC here with her perspective from Nigeria, but it's, it would be great to put in that hub more perspectives to what's happening in Brazil, for instance, in Portugal and other parts of the world, so we can like, 
um, share that some best practice or share the good experience. So this is definitely coming later in the year. In the meantime, if there's any questions, um, do not wait for us to post that on the website. Call us, talk to us, come to you know, um, email the alliance team, and we will be able to provide hopefully that information to you as well. Great, thanks, Raquel. Um, you know, good things on the way from the alliance. It was great to have you as the head of the alliance. Make time for. Um, for everyone here today, and I'd like to thank all of the panelists, Bishi calling in from Nigeria, John from the CDC in the U.S., and, and Stefan um, at WHO. It's been fantastic to hear national perspectives, patient perspectives, government perspectives, multilateral um, perspectives representing so many, so many member states. Um, you know, just so everyone knows, um, the video of tonight's be made available by the World Hepatitis Alliance. You'll all be notified and it'll be posted on their, on their website as well as the slide deck. So this can be a good um, resource to cut or to view in its entirety for, for trainings, for classes, um, and so on. Um, there's also two more webinars in this Tools for Change series. So the next is on Thursday, the 10th of March. Um, it'll be shown, um, or we'll run it twice, just like, like today, and it's on the subject of how we can interpret um, and leverage survey results um, for effective advocacy and we'll be looking specifically at the HCV Global Patient Survey and the third and final webinar in this series um, will be on um, April 4th, on Monday, April 4th, where we explore the influence um, media coverage has on um, policymakers and that awareness as a policy um, lever in, in general. So let me um, end on that note. Thank you everyone who called in. Thank you for being patient with us with the slide transfers. And thank you to all of the panelists for, for making uh, time here tonight in London.